Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Welcome to another Sabbath school for this week's lesson, The Ultimate Rest. But before we begin any of this, we have to actually invite the most important member to Sabbath school, and that's the Holy Spirit. Victor, could you pray for us? Certainly. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace as we meet at home and here this morning. Lord, not only do we want to feel your presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit, but Lord, I want us to, I, I want you to show us the ultimate rest, the ultimate, ultimate rest in you, O Lord. Now we know that the, on earth, the ultimate rest is temporary, but we are looking forward to have this eternal ultimate rest with you in heaven for an eternity. Heavenly Father, you have called us to hold on to the messages, to believe in you, to be your link on earth. Lord, you have told us to really trust you and believe you and accept all that you have done for us. And I pray, O oh Lord, that today we all make a decision, a decision to be yours perpetually until you come so that we may indeed be rejoicing with you eternally in heaven. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All righty. So we're going to start off by reading the memory verse, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. You know, so much scripture from the New Testament actually comes from the Old Testament. Yep. If we look at verse 9 that we just read, we can look at Isaiah 64, 4. That's right. For from days of old they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you, and that's capital U, who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. So God is always there with us. Jesus said it himself. He'll be with us till the end of the age. And this is the part that we look forward to, Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. That's the end we're looking forward to in the end. After this whole problem of sin is done away with. So let's take a look and see what it was like beforehand. Before sin, before the great controversy, because that's really what this is all about. So there was perfect order. And Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, page 60, 678, the great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Amen. So that's what it was like Amen. before sin. And at least that's the way it will be after it's done away with. And I'm guessing it's pretty close to that if it wasn't just like it. So what's, there's several great mysteries in the Bible. But one of them is, where did sin come from? We're going to read Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. 
So we can read about Lucifer and Isaiah, and we can read about him in Ezekiel, but this, he was made perfect. It is a mystery how sin or iniquity entered his heart, but once it did, oh, it found an abundant field to spread. Even if we look at Scripture, what was it? The dragon's tail took a third mm -hmm. of the stars? Sure. Doesn't the tail represent lies or deception? Yep. Those lies and deception deceived a third of the angels who were in the presence of God. So we know how sin started, not exactly how, but at least where. In Revelation 12, 7 through 12, we read, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. For they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you having great wrath knowing that he has only a short time. So we see the battle begin in heaven, mm -hmm. and then we see the battlefield change. Mm -hmm. And heaven is no longer at war, but earth is. If we look at a traditional war, a human war, there are soldiers, and then there are civilians, non-combatants, right? But this is not the case in the great controversy. As God created man in his image, after the fall, whose image did he take on then? That would be the image of Satan. Exactly. That sinful image. Exactly. We are not born with sin, but we sure like to practice it once we do come into this world, don't we? Starting with Genesis 3.12, the man blames the woman and God for his sin. The woman blames the serpent. And the character of Satan of sin was now the predominant character of man. Just look at Cain and Abel, one generation away. So the point of all this is that we already enlisted in an army of the enemy. There are no non-combatants here. And Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, mm -hmm. against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, basically against Satan and his minions. Remember that the great controversy is about Satan accusing God and his character, about saying God isn't fair. So, what happened to Adam and Eve um, and to Eve after they entered into sin? What did God do? Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise, or in other versions it says, crush you on, your, on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. We see the fate of Satan here and now when his head will be crushed someday. We know the end of the story, and Revelation makes it painfully clear. So we see in this verse, though, the promise of salvation. We see a loving God mm -hmm. who provides a way out for us from our sin through the cross. We know that Satan cannot win against God. When we saw that in heaven, when he was ousted, we see that in the crushing of the serpent's head. The only way that Satan can hurt God is by getting the very people that Christ came to save to be lost for all eternity. Mm -hmm. We can choose to love God, to trust and obey him, and join the ranks 
of the army of God to rest in the yoke of Christ Jesus and experience the peace that transcends all understanding or we can continue in our carnal nature and entertain ourselves with the world with all the world has to offer trying to fill that void with money power fame whatever it may be but never having true peace through it all just look at the world look at our world how could you want that but we're going to learn about this and how to get that peace because barbara i know you're going to tell us about sunday and a vision of the end a vision of the end so the last book of the bible is what we're going to be looking at today not the last revelation the last book of the bible and we're going to be looking at the first vision that john had but as we look back at John, we have to remember he was the oldest um, living, surviving disciple um, that had sat with Jesus. And now here he was on a rock in the middle of nowhere in Patmos. And so if you want to, th I, I was thinking about how, how John must feel that day. You know, he's, he's sitting there. And all these things are going through his mind. All these memories that he had of when Jesus walked on this earth. He was there in, um, in Acts when um, the angel said to him in Acts 111, Men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So that had been years ago now, and Jesus hadn't returned. Meanwhile, the other apostles present on that day had already died. And they died not pretty deaths. So we look at Peter. Peter, tradition says that he died in 64 to 68 AD during Nero's persecution of the Christians. He was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified on a cross. James, the son of Deb Zebedee, was beheaded by King Herod in, in A.D. 44. Bartholomew um, had ministered in Armenia and was flayed by knives. Philip uh, died in Turkey by hanging. Uh, Ma Matthew died a martyr's death in Ethiopia. Thomas says that he died near Madras, India. Madras, India. He was killed with a spear. James. Tradition says that James was crucified in Lower Egypt and then sawed into pieces. So not only did they kill him, then they had to saw him in two as well, or in little pieces. Thaddeus was martyred in Persia. He died with arrows. Uh, Simon, the... Um, the zealot. Yep. Tradition says that he was crucified. Mm -hmm. And then we have Judas who hanged himself. Yep. So everyone, ha all of the disciples had died. And as I was reading this and listening to this, and every time I, I, I look at how these um, apostles died, I think about the cost of being a disciple. Mm -hmm. But yet, we can have rest. And we're going to talk a little mm -hmm. bit more than this. Um, so there had been changes <clears throat> they'd felt they'd the, the church had 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 experienced changes horrible persecution um heretical movements from within <clears throat> and here is john he must have felt tired alone and restless and then suddenly he's given a vision so we're going to read this vision <clears throat> in uh revelation 1 9 through 19 John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in the book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. 
And as I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, clothed in a garment to the feet and girded about um, the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass and as refined as in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and the countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I felt, fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand upon me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives, was dead, and behold, I have... I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and death. Write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Amen. So Amen. As, as we look at, at this with John, that must have given him great joy and great mm-hmm. peace to see his master again. And even, even if um, in the vision... And knowing that God still had a plan for him and still had work for him. As we look at, um, at this um, period of time and being God being the first and the last, it gave John, again, a clear picture that Christ had conquered. He was in control. And that he would be there at the very end. He would be able to see John. He, John would be able to see Christ coming down from heaven, prepared for a bridegroom adorned for her husband. I want to read to you from Acts of the Apostles. This is, this is um, um, from Ellen White. And it tells us better than I can about how, what was going on with John. So we talk about John here being stuck on this, this island, but we have to back up. John had, was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of this faithful servant. Amen. Even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in the de- deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nazareth. John declared, my master patiently submitted all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am weak, sinful man. Christ was wholly harmless and undefiled. He did no sin. Neither was there any guile found in his mouth. What a picture of rest, that perfect peace of mind. The words... going on with Acts of the Apostles, we're in 570. The words had their influence on John and was removed from the cauldron by the very man who cast him in. Can you imagine that? The person who cast him into the cauldron of oil was actually had to help him out. That's pretty amazing. And again, the hand of persecution fell heavily upon the apostle. By the emperor's decree, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos condemned for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here his enemies thought his influence could no longer be felt, and he must finally die hardship and distress. I mean, they put him on the island so that they could (laughs) shut him up, if you will. And work him to death. And work him to death, right. Patmos was a barren rocky island in the Aegean Sea and had chosen, been chosen by the government as a place of banishment for criminals. Right. But to the servant of God, this gloomy abode became the gate of heaven. Here, shut away from the busy scenes of life and from the active labors of former years, he had companionship with God and Christ and the heavenly angels. And from them, he received instruction for the church for future time. Talk about giving him peace and rest. The events that would take place in the closing scenes of earth history were outlined before him. And there he wrote out visions he received from God when his voice could no longer testify of one whom he loved and served the messages given him on that barren coast were to go forth as a lamp that burneth declaring the nature and purpose 
of the Lord concerning the earth and the nation. Among the cliffs and the rocks of Patmos, John held communion with his maker. He reviewed his past life and thought of the blessings he had received and peace in his heart. So here we see that through all of the struggles of his life, he still found peace in his heart and he was able to commune with God. He had lived and he was optimistic. He had lived the life of a Christian and he could, could say in faith, we know that we have passed from death into life. Not so that emperor who had banished him, who could, could look back only on the fields of warfare, carnage, and desolate homes, on weeping widows and orphans, the fruit of his ambitions and desire of his preeminence. So being a disciple for Christ doesn't, make, doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, if we look at the lives of the apostles, it was very difficult. But through it, Christ was with them and gave them the peace they needed. Well, and you look at it, I know we're running over, but even in Acts 16, um, 25 and 6, when Paul and Silas are in prison, tending their wounds from being beaten, they're singing hymns. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even though your situation mm -hmm. might be bad, mm -hmm. if you have God with you, you can weather anything. Amen. And that's really important for us to keep in mind when we go through our, our struggles because we have them as well. Exactly. Okay. Victor, can you tell us about Monday, the countdown? Absolutely, and what a wonderful, what a wonderful lesson. And you, you know what's what what is for me, uh, the the great frustration is that I wish I could really uh, discuss this lesson in the time that I need to do it. There is not I'm going enough to do, time. I'm going to do my. This best. is the Reader's Digest That's version. Exactly, exactly. The countdown. So, what is that referring to? It's obviously the countdown to Christ's return. After all, you and I really desire to see our Lord. We really desire to come and live with the Lord, to with the Lord permanently and perpetually with a physical contact with the Lord. And so uh, the countdown to his return is certainly important. Monday's section of this week's lesson is based on Matthew chapter 24. This is Jesus' sermon on the last day signs, the last day events. When Jesus had left the temple court for the last time, he was accompanied by some of his disciples. Uh, among these were Peter and Andrew and James and John, and they climbed the Mount of Olives, which rises 400 feet above the Kidron Valley. Jesus and this group of disciples had a great view of the temple and of the city as they arrived at the top of Mount, Mount of Olives. As they looked over Jerusalem, the disciples called Jesus' attention to the temple buildings. They were shocked by Jesus' comment when he said to them, as we read in Matthew 24, 2, Matthew 24, 2, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And you can imagine, this must have affected the disciples' thought process as they sat on the slope of the Mount of Olives, contemplating the temple and the city, and thought about what Jesus had stated regarding the destruction of the temple. The disciples thought that something so destructive could only happen at the end of the world. And so they approached Jesus, and they asked, and we read that in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3, verses 3 of Matthew 24, tell us when all these things be, asked the disciples. And then they asked, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age, the end of the world? The disciples were actually asking two different questions. Pay attention. The first, when will these things be? He was obviously, they were obviously referring to the destruction of the temple and also to the fall of Jerusalem. And the second question was, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world, the end of the age? In Jesus' reply, as we read in Matthew 24, Jesus blended the two questions, the two events, 
First, he told the disciples about events that would lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Uh, these predictions are found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 20. And they would primarily apply to events between Jesus' departure from earth, his ascension into heaven, and the destruction of Jerusalem. So very briefly, in verses 4 of chapter 24, Jesus tells the disciples to avoid being deceived or led astray. In verse 5, Jesus tells them, Many will pretend to be the Messiah and will deceive. Those that pretend to be the Messiah will deceive a lot of people. By the way, there were many false messiahs during this period. In verse 6, Jesus tells them there would be wars and rumors of wars. Do so, so do not be surprised or alarmed. Then in verse 7, Jesus tells them, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Then in verse 8, and this is remarkable, this is all sequential. In verse 8, Jesus states that all these are the beginnings of sorrow. Now, if you see this happening, it is not quite there yet. Then in verse 9 to 14, Jesus says, they will deliver you up, to tribulation, and they will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offered, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the, lo the love of many will grow cold. A love for God will grow cold. A love for a neighbor will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And then verses 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. What a promise. By the way, these words of Christ were literally fulfilled in events prior to the fold of Jerusalem. It is important that we understand that. It is important that we also understand that these events also serve as a preview of what is happening and what will happen just before Jesus' second coming. But in his reply to the disciples, Jesus also mentioned the signs that would take place before his return. I just do not have time to read this for you today. But I'm hoping that you will read on your home. So in Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 to 29, Jesus mentions the signs that reveal the nearness of his coming. So the birth pains are now more intense and happening a lot more sooner. In Matthew 24, verses 30 to 35, 24, 30 to 35, all the signs mentioned in these verses are indications that Christ's second coming is approaching. It is now at the door. It is now at the door. You can see the countdown. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 30, 36 to 39, Jesus tells us that no man knows the exact, exact, exact time of Christ's return. But he also tells us that human beings, will continue to go about their everyday activities until the event catches them by surprise. And you know, remarkably, the Lord wanted us to remember. So this is why, as a sign and as a warning, Jesus calls our attention, your attention and my attention, to what happened during Noah's day just before the great flood. So let's read what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 to 39. Jesus tells us as follows. But as, but as the day of Noah were, in other words, as it were, as it were, as it happened in Noah's day, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That will happen just before the Lord comes. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark 
and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Ah, oh, these are sad words. It is unfortunate that in spite of years of preaching and warnings about a worldwide flood destruction, only eight people in all the world were ready for it. Only eight people in the world were saved from it. See, Matthew 24 and 25 is one of Jesus' most famous sermons, which covers the uninterrupted historical timeline from Christ's days on earth until his second coming and beyond. In this sermon, Jesus provides his people throughout the ages a rough sketch of the divine schedule for end time prophecies and events so that those living at the end of time can be prepared for the ultimate event, his second coming. Jesus wants us to be able to rest confidentially in his love, even when everything around us is falling apart. Jesus wants us to be prepared for a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, as described in Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1. And this is what Daniel tells us in that verse. At the time, Michael, and Michael is Christ, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book of life. This prophecy, my friend, this prophecy, which precedes Jesus' second coming, will be fulfilled. You know, Jesus did not give us a date for his coming, but he did tell us about signs that would allow us to know when his coming was near and at the door. Jesus' coming will be literal, a literal event. Considering the amount of information given to his return in prophecy and in Scripture, including Jesus' sermons, this is a big deal. It's a big deal for you, and it's a big deal for me. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready for Christ's return? He is coming together, his elect, to take them home with him. And so let me ask you, are you looking forward to meeting Jesus in the air as he approached the earth? Amen. Thank you, Victor. Tuesday, we're going to look at the lesson, Marching Orders. I like this part. A call to action. So we're going to actually start off reading Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And if you have a red, red letter Bible, this is Jesus speaking. Amen. So what is this called? The Great Commission. This is the last command that Jesus gave his disciples. So who's supposed to do it? All of us, if you're a disciple. Amen. Obviously, not everybody baptizes, but all disciples are to be telling someone about Jesus. How are we supposed to do that? Well, we have the three angels' message. We even have a TV network named yep. after that. Mm -hmm. Our instruction book for this. So let's read Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And essentially we know from Revelation as well, that's everybody. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and springs of water. And another angel, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her immorality. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also 
will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone and the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So the title for this lesson is Marching Orders. Are you a soldier for God? We have a song on we're Christian soldiers, right? But are we? Verse 6, are you telling someone about the message of the everlasting gospel? Whether it is someone halfway around the world or your next door neighbor. But one may say, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Fair enough. Even if you are not out there exclaiming the good news to people or testifying about what God has done for you, do they see that in your life? Do they know that you're a Christian? Do they realize what they're missing in their own lives and what you have? Verse 7, are you telling someone to worship the God of creation? The God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who created the earth in six days and established his holy Sabbath on the seventh day. Do you know this is, or do people know this is what you believe? I remember a while back, we had the seven-day Adventist guy named Ben Carson running for president. And my wife had the view on. She was watching something. And one of the ladies there, Basically said, can you believe that God made the world in six days? He's lost it, right? Now let me ask you this, which is more crazy, that God planned this out and did it all, or that there's a big bang theory where this mass of dense data suddenly explodes and magically makes all the planets, stars, and galaxies, and then a meteorite, or maybe a comet, with the building blocks of life hits the earth, and the earliest forms of life are formed from some primordial ooze. This eventually evolves into all the life on the earth, including human beings, by sheer chance. <laughs> That's crazy. Are we seeking to save souls for God? You've got to ask yourself. Because we hear in Revelation 18.4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. Are we looking for those that are lost? 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. There's a world perishing out there. Do we go out looking for them? Because God wants to use each one of us to go to that perishing world and save somebody, or at least tell them about God, even if it's just one person. And in verse 12, are we the persevering saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith in Jesus? Are we these disciples, these soldiers for Christ? Remember, Jesus died for everyone, and he wants to save everyone as well. And he wants to use us to bring those lost souls to him, that they may have his rest as well in their lives. So, you may ask, how does God expect us to do this? What soldier goes to war without the right equipment? As the phrase goes, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Our battle is in the spiritual realm, though. So God tells us, to, tells us how to suit up for battle. If we read Ephesians 6, 13 through 18, about the armor of God. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That same word, peace, is shalom, not completeness. 
In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith that with or which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. I love this. We don't actually have time to go in depth on this because as Victor said earlier, we could spend quite a while. But the short version, to gird, gird up your loins with the truth means to be ready for action for God Amen. and his truth. Amen. Are you ready to be mobilized for God? Mm -hmm. And when the Holy Spirit calls you to action, mm -hmm. to, lead, to, to lead Holy Spirit led lives? Because I tell you, I've had the Holy Spirit convict me before, and I'm a little hesitant sometimes. So are we ready to go? The blessed breastplate of righteousness. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 calls it the breastplate of faith and love. This is the faith and love that we trust and have in Jesus Christ and the salvation that he purchased for us on the cross that covers our own iniquity and makes us righteous. And having your feet, having shod your feet with the gospel of peace, or that would be bringing the good news, the gospel of the salvation of Jesus Christ. You're telling someone about it. You're actively going around and making it known. The shield of faith that extinguishes all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Who is the only one who ever defeated Lucifer? Right. Exactly. Gabriel tried in Daniel. He could not overcome the prince right. of Persia. So, and Michael had to overcome him. In heaven or in Daniel chapter 12, it says of both, Michael, God is the only one who can protect you from him. Amen. And the helmet of salvation protects your thoughts, mm -hmm. your mind from temptation, keeps you focused on the promises of God and his goals and his ideals. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How much time do you spend in His Word? Do you know Scripture? <clears throat> Could you tell us somebody tried to deceive you with Scripture? This, this Word of God and prayer are your offensive weapons against the evil one. God not only, def not only defends you, but He gives you the power to fight back. Are you coming to the cross every day? And dying to self so that Christ may reign supreme in your hearts. Are you ready for action for God? And if so, you not, if so, please. But if not, you have to ask yourself what's holding you back. Because these are keys to having that rest and completeness in God. Amen. Amen. Barbara, can you tell us about Wednesday to rest in peace? Yes. You know... Man has been looking for, forward to Christ's return since they left the garden. Eden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Since so, Genesis 3.15. So that's been about 6,000 years. And it's truly the culmination of all our hopes, isn't it? And um, if you think about all the people through history, and, and actually that's our ministry is to, to tell people of Christ. That's been ever since he... He was here to teach people about Christ and that he's coming back to save them. And I think about um, a time here not too long ago, well, it's been a few hundred years now, or almost a couple hundred years now, where um, in 1844, where everyone thought Christ was coming, his second coming had arrived, but they were, they were mistaken on that point, but... The end began then. And so those of us who follow prophecy can see the events as escalating, can't we? Right. The, the, the end time events escalating. And as the birth pangs get closer and closer together, you know, how do we have that rest? Right. But God has a promise for all of us who are looking forward to the promise of a heavenly home. And we're going to look at, at Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. Now, Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. Yep. 
and we look at the faith of Cain and Enoch and Abraham and Sarah and many of the, the greats um, of the Old Testament and their faith. And we're going to start at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity would have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared them for the city. So all of these greats that we're talking about in Hebrews realized that this earth was not their home. And they were willing to put God first. They were willing to follow him. And as it says in Revelation, follow the lamb wherever he goes. And so today, as we think about where we're at in life, are we willing to follow Christ wherever he goes? So, but, but just a little switch on this. These verses don't make a whole lot of sense if we look at the popular version of death. In many ways, <clears throat> um, that these... Um, oh, such as not receiving the promises that we just read. They're dead, supposedly, now up in heaven with Jesus enjoying a reward. So how can they not receive the promise and still be with Jesus in heaven? It, do, it just doesn't make any sense. Many of you have been to funerals, and I think of when Billy Graham died. We heard again and again, they're now with Jesus in heaven. They're now with Jesus in heaven. And I, I've, I've heard this in many uh, funerals I've gone that I've attended. But um, um, there's irony in this view because often when someone dies, we hear, may he or she rest in peace. So they're supposed to be resting in peace, yet they're in heaven with Christ, and Christ is going to come back and get them even though they're in heaven. So you better pick one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You need to pick one. That's right. So let's take a look at what and Christ. Pick the right one. Right? <laughs> exactly. Let's, pick let's the pick biblical the right one. one. Let's pick the. So that's what we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes. Is what is the biblical ones? Exactly. So John eleven eleven. These things he said, and after he said them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to wake him up. In fact, the idea of resting in peace is, of course, the truth about what happens at death. The dead are truly at rest. In fact, if you go through the Old Testament and you look at the kings, over and over and over you'll see, and David slept with his fathers, right. and Hezekiah slept with his fathers. Right. Well, even in Acts, David's still right. sleeping with his fathers. I know. After we're gonna, Jesus went to heaven. We're going to get to that Correct. scripture Sorry. in just a minute. As we speak. He's, he's still, still, at, still, still at rest. To the believer, death is but a small matter. Christ speaks of it as it were a little moment. If a man keeps saying he shall never see death, he shall never taste death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, they shall also appear with him in glory. And that's from the Desire of Ages, page 787. So when we, let's go back to this John 11 where, um, where he's saying Lazarus is asleep. If we look later on in the, the scripture, he finally has to tell the followers who were following him to, to, to go to Lazarus because they were thinking, oh, if Lazarus is asleep, then he's getting better. He's doing well. And finally, Christ has to turn to them and say, in, in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. So there's some other scriptures I want us to look at really quickly here too. Um, Ecclesiastes 9.5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not nothing. 
and neither have they no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten so when we go to the grave it is asleep but for a moment and we don't know what's going on I know that I've heard people say you know my my loved one who passed is looking down on me and taking care of me that's not the reality and that, I, I really that's I had one person tell me oh I'm so glad to know this it was really creepy to think my husband was following me around after he died that's more ancestor so. worship than anything else <laughs> Psalms 146 4 says his spirits departs he returns to the earth in that very day his thoughts perish Acts 2 29 34 and 35 men and brethren let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David and this is interesting because David in Psalms had already told us that when he returns to the earth his thoughts perish but here is Peter talking about David men and brethren let me speak freely to you the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and in the tomb is with us to this day so he's there in the tomb today and he's still there as, as Victor said a few minutes ago he's still there today for David did not ascend to the heavens but he says himself the Lord shall said to my Lord sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool so David knows he's waiting until um, Christ's enemies are his footstool. But he also emphasizes that both the saved and the lost will receive a reward after the resurrection. And we see this in John 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel for this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil until the resurrection of condemnation. Desire of Ages tells us Christ is coming with the clouds with great glory and multitude of shining angels attend him. In fact, it's going to be all the angels in heaven that are here would come with him. Amen. He will Amen. come and raise the dead and to change the living saints from glory to glory. Amen. He will come to honor those who loved him and kept his commandments and to take them to himself. He has forgotten them. He has not forgotten them nor his promise. There will be a relinking of the family chain. When we look upon our dead, we may think of mourning when the trump of God shall sound, when the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So it's like mourning. We sleep a little while and we wake. A little longer and he shall see the king in his beauty. A little longer he will wipe the tears from our eyes. A little longer. He will present us faultless before the presence of his glory and with exceeding joy. Wherefore, when he gave the sign of his coming, he said, When these things begin to come to pass, look up. Lift up your head, for your redemption draws nigh. And that's the hope we have now, too, as we can look up. Because what an incredible hope, Barbara. What an yeah. incredible Amen. hope. And that really, that really blends so well with Thursday's lesson. Because it's about rejoicing. Rejoicing in this hope rejoicing in what God is, is about to do as he comes for his people, rejoicing the Lord always. You know, while the Apostle Paul was imprisoned in Rome, he wrote an encouraging letter to the believers of Philippi, or if you want it, call it Philippi, then call it Philippi. Some Bible commentators have labeled the book of Philippians the epistle of joy. In this short four-chapter four uh, letter, Paul uses the word joy or rejoicing repeatedly. And in fact, I, it's one of my favorite books of Scripture. You know, the theme of chapter 1 is joy in trials. The theme of chapter 2 is joy in humility. When Paul really understood uh, that he was nothing and God was everything. The, th the theme of chapter 3 is joy in surrender, and the theme of chapter 4 is joy in gratitude. What a, what a book. Paul learned to live in the joy of Christ because he discovered how to rest in Christ. He believed that Christ would strengthen him in every situation and supply his needs. He tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 and 19, Philippians 4, 13, 19, I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthen me. And verse 19, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Powerful stuff. As uh, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Philippians 3, Philippians 3, 20, 21, his confidence was fixed on the divine reality that our citizenship is in heaven, as he writes in verse 20, from which he also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's important. For one day, Christ would as he wrote in verse 21, transform our lowly body that we may be conformed to his, to Christ's glorious body. And that he eagerly, awaiting, he eagerly awaited the coming of the Savior, uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, as he tells in verse 20. As we read in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4, Paul was able to rejoice in the Lord always, because he had absolute confidence that Christ would take care of him in the present and of the fulfillment of Christ's eternal plan in the future. His statement, statement in Philippians chapter 4, verses 5, that the Lord is at hand, gave him the peace of God which surpasses all understanding as he wrote in verses 7 of chapter 4. Paul is not saying to rejoice always. That's not what he says. He's not saying to you and me, rejoice always, to receive or to rejoice in all the trials that we are facing is very difficult. Instead, what Paul is saying is, rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what our present situation is like no matter what trials or tribulations we are facing right now, rejoice in the Lord always. I believe that Paul is telling us that if we dwell on God and if we dwell on His goodness, if we dwell in His love and on His sacrifice on the cross for each one of us, that we can rejoice in Him and have peace for, um, for our weary souls every day. You see, the Lord is always the same. Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love, His consideration, His power are the same in times of affliction as in times of prosperity. Christ's ability to give peace to the heart does not depend on external circumstances. Therefore, the heart that is centered on Christ may constantly rejoice. And that's why he's appealing to you and to me to rejoice in the Lord always. Along with the, the Apostle Paul, we can rejoice that there is never a situation we face in which Christ does not provide does not provide immediate help for us today or hope for tomorrow and the promise, promise of ultimate rest in Christ for all eternity. You know, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 to 7, Philippians 4, 5 to 7, let your gentleness be known to all man. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What an incredible promise. You see, because the Lord is near and ever present in our daily lives, let's live with peace and let's be gentle and kind. Paul admonishes us to avoid the painful anxiety that is inevitable in those who are dependent on, on themselves for their life journey. It is just a fact that there is nothing that may affect the peace of a Christian that is too small for God to notice it. Just as there is nothing too great for God to take care of. He knows what we need, 
And he wants us to have everything that is for our good. So why should we be burdened with cares which may be laid on him through prayer and supplication? Why not rejoice with the Lord always? Those who live a prayer-filled life will have the peace that comes from God. This is a peace that is grounded on faith in God and a personal knowledge of His power and care. This is a peace that comes to us when God abides in us and produces childlike confidence and trustful love. In Christ Jesus, the peace of God keeps the believer in union with Christ. Paul in Philippians chapter 4 verses 5 tells us that the Lord is at hand. He's always there. He is very close to us. It is just a fact that life here on earth is full of tensions and trials and struggles. None of us escape them. Certainly the Apostle Paul, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, didn't escape them. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7, Paul is eager to tell you and I, to tell us all, that even with all that we endure now, we can rejoice in what we have been given in Christ. And indeed, we can find rest for our souls. Right here, right now, today. My call to action for you and for me, rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. Thank you, Victor. Barbara, do you have some final thoughts? I have. I've been thinking a lot this week about what it means to be a disciple. And I was having a, a conversation with the pastor this week, and he we were talking about some pretty serious things, and he said, are you ready to be crucified? And it, it, it took me back a little bit. But that's, that's kind of my question to all of you as well. Are you ready, and will you have peace to stand when the time comes that you have to stand for Christ? Will you give up your livelihood? Will you give up your family if that's what it takes? Will you willing to preach the straight truth? Are you willing to stand for the pressures before us? Today, we're already starting to see it in many ways here on this earth where um, we have to make choices. And so as God leads you, are you willing to make those choices and have peace in him no matter what the cost of that choice is? Amen. Yeah, I've, we've already seen people kind of, how should I put it, get stress cracks under the pressure. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, my final message would be this. I'd like to read Revelation 22, 10 through 15. Amen. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I want to pause there for a moment. If we are following Christ, <laughs> we are supposed to be looking forward to this <laughs> because our reward is something wonderful. If you're worried about this day, you might want to examine your spiritual life. Amen. And let's continue with verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Amen. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take much to keep you out. Just a cherished sin or two. That you say, God, I'm not 
ready to relinquish this to you. But then I may have said this before. There's an analogy I like to use. Christ will cover you with his righteousness. But if you have part of you that you have not submitted to him, Amen. he cannot cover you there. Amen. Because sin and God do not agree. And folks, that's going to be a spot or a wrinkle. Yep. And that will keep you out of heaven. So are we making our choice for God? Are we living a spirit-led life? Amen. And are we, are we putting the things of this world ahead of the Lord? Because we see the world change. And when COVID first hit, a lot of people were very apprehensive and turned to God. And now that it's become the new normal, you see them fade away. A relationship with God is not an impulse or a scared reaction. A relationship with God is something that you build over time and you form. And it's rock solid in the time of trouble so that you can stand against the evil one and his schemes. So let us come to God. Amen. Let us surrender to him that we truly may have life in him eternal. And let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are life. You give us life, Lord. Every new child in this world is a gift from you. Amen. Every morning that we awaken and we're still breathing, Lord, is a gift from you. Amen. Teach us to realize this. Teach us to understand that tomorrow may be our last. And Lord, if that happens, our probation is closed. How are we living for you today? And Lord, are we truly making you Lord of our lives? We can't have two kings. It's either you or us. And even if it's 10% us, it's still us, Lord. We pray and ask that your Holy Spirit may dwell in each one of us watching that you may impress on the hearts and minds of everyone that now is the time to be a soldier for Christ, to be, to be marching for the Lord Amen. and to change whatever may not, might be needed, Lord, to truly surrender all to you. Our hope is to see everyone in heaven someday, Lord, that we may have a reunion around Christ Jesus. Yes, Lord. I pray this for everyone watching for all the members of the church and Lord, for truly all that have been predestined to be saved and that's everyone in the world. Yes, and we pray this to your Father in heaven through our high priest, our intercessor, Christ Jesus. Amen, Lord. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.